Yes, dear. Thank you very much. Good evening. <clears throat> huh? I know, but not enough. There's not nearly, not nearly, not nearly enough coffee. <clears throat> because I have been running on coffee for the last week. Um, hi, I'm Christopher Balzano. I'm Natalie Chris. And welcome to Tripping on Legends Live under the paranormal influence. Um, and if you think that you are not under the paranormal influence, um, you're wrong, right? Uh, and I'm, of course, most of this is going out to my paranormal friends and hopefully um, people that are uh, consumers of the paranormal, but also people who consider themselves uh, in support of the paranormal field. Um, this show is for you. In that, uh, we're talking about what are the greatest paranormal influences over the last 50 years. So I think that this you're going to get a different list and, get, and some different entries from people who are um, consumers of the paranormal, people who watch scary movies or they watch the, the, the television shows, um, but also people who are on the inside. What has been impacting them? What do they think has been the most important thing? And um, so I guess some housekeeping issues having to do with this. Uh, this was supposed to go up. We were supposed to do this September 19th, September 20th, I think. September 19th. So I think it was my sister's birthday because I, I called her. Um, and um, I couldn't that night. Some things happened. And then, boom, the next day I was in the hospital. Um, thank you very much. And I was in the hospital for like four days and then kind of recovering. It was really weird. Like I wish I could say that I was in the hospital for something really cool. Like I got into a knife fight or like I was saving these children from a fight. No, I had kidney stones. And despite what the insurance company says, uh, it was crucial that I be in the hospital because it was kind of a dangerous situation and kidneys were like doing all this crazy stuff. Um, and so I just kind of got delayed and delayed and delayed. We talked about um, some other things that are coming up in um, Tripping on Legends world. And we're like, no, we have to go do that show because when we first started talking about it, there was a really good response from people and they wanted to share what their stuff was. Um, and so uh, as I talk, please feel free to add what you think uh, is the most influential moment in the paranormal and supernatural world in the last 50 years. And 50 years is kind of an arbitrary thing. Um, and I think partly I said 50 years and not of all time um, is that uh, I wanted to leave out um, primarily, I wanted to leave out um, Roswell um, because I think that the Roswell is one of those things that looms larger than maybe anything else. Um, it's probably the, I'm moving the camera on a little bit to find the best shot. Um, it's probably the most known thing to people who don't even know uh, ghosts or UFOs or cryptids or any of those kind of things. Um, and so I thought like, well, I want to make it past that. I want to make it modern because the easiest thing to do is to say, oh, you know, the founding of the um, the paranormal side or the psychic society or some of the stuff that um, those early people were doing. Um, and I think that's very influential, but I think we live in a different world now. Um, and I think what Arthur, Sir, Carl, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle was doing back at the turn of the last century um, is not necessarily as relevant to what this discussion is, right? So we're right here at Tripping Legends, we're all about what are the things that happen that influence the way that we view our world, the way that we view the paranormal, the way we view the supernatural, um, and then kind of spiral, right? And so stuff happens and we automatically fall back on the easiest. Whenever I go like this, I'm talking to Natalie. Natalie's right here, but she doesn't want to be on camera. Um, whenever we do that, we we fall back on these things that we know, right? And so for us to um, to say something is influential, it's gotta be something that molds that, even if we don't even realize that it's molding it. Um, and so I wanted to look at the last 50 years um, just to include some things that I think are really important. And I'm gonna go through um, kind of why, why this, these influences happen. Okay, or the impact that they have on us. And I wanted to say first that, um, you know, I think that there was a time where um, individuals um, and books probably had a bigger impact on us 
um, not only just as the paranormal world, but just in general, than they do now, right? So if we're going to be realistic, and we're going to look at like the last 30 years, because um, I think really the, the paranormal has been an upswing for about that amount of time. If we're looking at that, we have to be realistic and say that um, someone's social media, someone's uh, television show, these have probably a bigger impact on a wider amount of people because they're consuming it more, right? And so for something to really move the needle of the way that we think about things or the way that we do things, it's got to hit a whole bunch of people, right? Um, and so we can look at this two different ways. We can look at it as the influence over people who are in the paranormal field um, and who do stuff in it and how we've changed the way that we approach things or the way we change look at things um, and say that there are certain things that, that mean that for us, right? They mean they're important to us. They influenced us because they changed how we went out in the field and did things. They made us go out in the field and do things. Um, or they impacted the way that we view ghosts. You know, and I'm primarily a ghost person, but I'm going to be talking about other things. And then you have the people who are impacted by it, who are not in the paranormal field, who maybe were converted to it, or just now have the dialogue. You know, if you talk to someone 20 years ago when you threw out a word like EVP, they didn't know what you were talking about, right? Or if you even threw out a word like cryptid, no one knew what you were talking about. Um, maybe they knew Bigfoot, maybe they'd heard of Bigfoot. If they were in a certain area, they might've heard of like their Jersey devil or, or, or what's that, what's that dude's name in Wisconsin? Mojo, right? Um, Moth, or maybe Mothman, right? Um, and yet <clears throat> there are some things that were so big that they transcend that, right? They, they broke through those barriers. Um, and I want to talk, well, why don't we start talking about Mothman first? Okay. How does that sound? Sounds because good. There were more than one person who said Mothman uh, and the Mothman case. And the Mothman case, and someone please correct me uh, if you're in the, the, the chat room. Um, Wait, but I what believe was the other one called the Dover? The Dover Demon. Dover Demon. The Dover Demon. Um, we'll, oh, we'll get to that. Okay. All right, because that kind of makes my list. Spoilers. Dover Demon kind of makes my list, but in a, in a bigger sense. Um, Mothman, I think is not as influential uh, outside of the paranormal as we think it is. Um, there were people that we ran into when we were at the Mothman monument who didn't know what it was. Right. Right. And they're, so they're cool. in some random town in West Virginia. Like, well, why are you here if you're not into Mothman? And I think with Mothman, I'm going to, I know I'm going to get these dates wrong. I originally had a whole thing written out and I couldn't find it for this. It was in 1963, I believe. Um, you're supposed to be my fact checker. I'm trying to post on. Okay. <laughs> I'm just playing with what you. What are you trying to. Um, Mothman, you... 1963. Um, and, and, and I think that people know the word Mothman and they maybe know some of the details of the 66. case. 1966. But they don't know. It didn't change their lives, right? And obviously, we've gotten writers from that and we've gotten people who have investigated that and people who bring that case up. And I think it's an important case and I think people um, touch upon it and people know it and they, and they, but I don't think it's, I don't even think within the paranormal world, it's as big as those people who are into Mothman feel. Um, also, keep in mind, if you're in the room, I want to hear your suggestions as I go and I can address them because I'm just going to go by some of the ones that um, the first ones of people who said and, and maybe why they're not as much. And then I'm going to do my list, my countdown. Um, and I was going to do it all. Do you remember? Um, do you remember? Uh, bless you. Do you remember? Um, not Bill and Ted. Uh, 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 Wayne. Wayne and Garth. Of course. And they would do Excellent. their lists and they had and they had the. Um, I, I originally had made one of those and I couldn't find it. I'd made a, oh. I'd made an actual list of my top five and like. You should have done that. I know that hospitals are horrible. Um, my life was totally like turned upside down in the last month. Um, but uh, some of the other things that people said that I thought were uh, interesting. Um, a lot of people, well, by a lot of I mean like a few people, mentioned the uh, entity case. Um, and the uh, and then a few people mentioned the exorcist coming out and so i think that um there are cases that everyone knows about um i'm not quite sure uh the exorcist case the exorcist movie coming out i feel is more like it, it's it's inspiration in the paranormal world was much more about um people then turning to christianity and so i do think it had like a really big impact on people um but I think it kind of faded out. 
And I think that we don't look at The Exorcist now. And Natalie just saw The Exorcist this weekend. Um, what did you think of it? It was good. It was good. She made me talk for like a half hour about like rainbows and sunshine and, <laughs> I did not and sweet lie. things. Um, but um, I don't think, I don't know if it's, Wait, if its impact those, has been as overwhelming over the years. Yeah. What are those cave dwelling people's called? Um, cave dwelling people? Not cave, the mine, mine people, the... Um, Archaeologists? No, you asked. They're... Tommy knockers, never mind. It's oh, Tommy knockers. Why are you looking up Tommy knockers? I'm not. I am hashtagging. Okay, she's hashtagging hop knock, Tommy knockers. You're gonna get the book. Um, so, hey, Jen, we were literally just talking about you ten minutes ago. Um, so I've got to message you afterwards about a mutual friend of ours. So it's good to see you uh, in the room. Um, so I'm not sure. I'm not sure that the entity case. Uh, do you have you ever heard of it? No. There you go. Um, I think for us as investigators, it became a touch. Okay. Well, that's what, no, the whole point of what I'm saying is it's like for something to be truly influential, it's got to cross over that line. So the people who normally don't, so people who I was looking at you, so people who normally don't consume or don't know, know it. Right. Um, so why don't we start on my list and hopefully my list will spark some discussion, uh, here. Um, all right. Why don't we start with cases? Because we're already talking about the entity case. And I'm going to say case, oh, my number five, five of the most influential uh, moments in the paranormal and supernatural. And it's going to be kind of controversial, I think. But here it is. I think the Amityville Horror case. I think I think that the, the, the publishing, so yeah, I guess you could say the publishing of, of, of the Amityville Horror book uh, the, the original is the fifth most influential moment in the in the paranormal history. Wait, I've got a quick question. Yes, I know your history with Amityville. Yeah, I'm kind of a little concerned talking about it, but we're not. I'm not in my house, so. Okay, my thanks a lot. Okay, go ahead. Pass. Am I allowed to have? Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. fantastic. Keep going. So, for those of you guys who don't know, I do have a history. I do have we. I do have kind of a dark history with. Uh, I had some personal involvement in the case, but I think Amityville is important. Whether it's fake or whether it's not fake, let's not even think of it in those terms. Let's just think of the amount of exposure it got. Um, when the book was released, it was kind of this almost rebirth of pulp, um, and 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 it was this mixture of, of of taking true crime and mixing it with the pulp flavor. And you have <laughs> some really really dramatic. They're almost kind of like the bastard sons of In Cold Blood, right? So what Capote was trying to do back then. Um, kind of got twisted out of control, spun out of control, and people were creating these uh, books that were inspired by true events that were maybe partly fiction, maybe partly truth, um, and very sensational. Uh, and they caught fire. And I think that the Amityville case did that. I mean, just look at the number of movies that have been made, the number of documentaries, the number of spin-off documentaries. You can go to pretty much anyone and say the word Amityville and they know what you're talking about. I can go to my 15 year old students in school and say the word Amityville and they have some frame of reference for it, right? Uh, they know Lizzie Borden and they know, and they know Amityville. And so I think that that case is really revolutionary in that um, it had all the elements of a really good ghost story. Um, it had the Warrens involved with it. Now, now, now I'm moving away from just the book, but just the case itself. The Warrens were attached to it, and they were a lot of people's first exposure to the Warrens, who were, you know, pretty influential. Um, you know, and that influence is coming back. It's kind of gone in waves. Um, and so I think that that the idea of a family who was innocent, and we can obviously debate how innocent the family was. Um, Suffering so badly they had to leave their house uh, is kind of every homeowner's terror, right? And it's something very real, and it's something very visceral, and you can imagine it, right? It is right there. Um, and, oh, I'll get to that. <laughs> and um, and, and, and there, it's impossible to hear the case, even in the most skeptical way, and not be impacted by it some way. And when I speak to people, um, when I am just kind of having conversations and people hear what I do, 
it's one of the cases that I'm always asked about. I'm like, I didn't investigate it. I was like two at the time, you know, like, but it's one of those stories that keeps coming up, keeps coming up 40 something years later. It's still influential and people are still talking about it. So my number five is um, the Amityville horror case or the Amity case. What do you guys think? Love to hear responses about why, if you think that this is actually something that um, is influential. Number four, number four on my list. And I think um, a lot of people put this uh, or, or mention things like this, but I'm just going to put it out there. For me, number four is um, October of 2004, um, the premiere of Ghost Hunters on television. Whoop, we should probably sound, oh, it's you. I know, but I should still sound my phone. Um, the premiere of Ghost Hunters on television. Keep in mind, in everything that I'm saying, I'm not endorsing. I'm not saying my opinion on these things, whether I like them or not. I'm not a big fan of Ghost Hunters. Um, and a lot of people mentioned, it was odd, more people mentioned Ghost Adventures than they mentioned Ghost Hunters. So I'm going to kind of put them together. I'm going to kind of package them together, or I'm going to use one to talk about the other. But I honestly do feel that the premiere of Ghost Hunters changed the way um, that the paranormal is looked at. Um, that idea that an everyday person could go out and look for this stuff. Um, we've all we've all probably seen ghost uh, pair poltergeists and, and things like that, uh, where there was paranormal investigators, there was parapsychologists who were out in the field, they were doing this research. We were kind of amazed by that, right? Like, oh my god, people do this for a living. Um, and then we kind of push it to the side a little bit, right? Um, but here were people who were going out. They were actively, they were organized. Um, they had a process that they were going through. They talked to us about what they were they were experiencing. Here's why here's why this is so influential. And some people might even put it up more than four. Um, I think that it it allowed people who had this urge that they didn't quite know what it was. I think it allowed them to satisfy that right? It inspired them to go out and do it themselves. Like what can be more influential than something that says, now go form your own group, right? And now go do it yourself. And now form societies. And now in here, we'll even help you. The TAPS family, you know, became like a network. And, and people were able to, for the first time, see themselves in these paranormal people who were, who were on TV, right? So if you take something um, like, you know, you, you were, if you're watching a movie and the movie had parapsychologists, they're probably, you weren't gonna be gonna go out and become a parapsychologist. But you could take up equipment and you can go out and you could do what you saw ghost hunters do. And that was very important for people. Now, a lot of people will say there's a negative consequence to that, but the fact of the matter is, if ghost hunters hadn't come out, um, people wouldn't be paying nearly as much attention to anything that paranormal investigators were doing um, because it also gave, and you know, I hate this word, right? It gave the client a place to go to, to, to talk to someone, right? So if we didn't have ghost hunters, that idea of, I have a problem with a ghost. I'm going to go call someone that might help me with it wouldn't be as readily accessible to the general public, right? But this idea that there were people out there and then there were people that they inspired to do that, that actually allowed the average everyday person, even if they didn't watch the TV shows, to know that these were. I will, liter I will say that literally, almost literally, <laughs> every single person I talk to who is not in the paranormal field when they hear about what I do, what do they always say? You mean like ghost hunters? You're like, you're like ghost hunters? And the funny thing is, is they're talking to me as a person and they still use the plural ghost hunters, <laughs> right? Oh, you mean like you're a ghost hunters? Um, and, I, and I think that a lot of that has to do with not only the cases and not only the, the satisfying a need, but the personalities that were involved. Um, and the soap opera aspect of it allowed people to not only tune in for the ghosts and the investigations, but also to kind of stay around and see how these relationships were. Um, now, ghostly adv Ghost Adventures, Ghostly Adventures would be my book. Ghost Adventures would be the TV show, which is much more influential than me. Um, a lot of people said that like their first live show uh, or their approach to um, 
ghost hunting is uh, maybe more uh, in line with what people like, that it's actually more influential than ghost hunters. So I guess the first thing I would love to know is like, have people, um, I would love to have people say which they think is the more influential show, not the better show, but the more influential show, Ghost Hunters or um, or or, or uh, Ghost Adventures. Um, and I understand I, I've never watched an episode of Ghost Adventures, um, but I, I know about it because people talk to me about it and stuff like that. Uh, and the weird thing is, is that I've actually helped Jeff with the research for Ghost Hunters, I mean Ghost Adventures, but I've never actually watched the episodes that I've helped with, which is weird. Um, but uh, from what I gather, it's a much more confrontational, but it's also a much more isolated thing. Like they go to a place as opposed to getting a client. And, and I know Ghost Hunters switch that as well. Um, I asked just some people, which they thought was, and your average person on the street who consumes paranormal media thinks that Ghost uh, Adventures is more influential. Um, I'm not sure how many people were sparked to start their own ghost hunting groups by watching Ghost Adventures, because I think those guys have less of an everyday average Joe feel to them um, and have less of an organizational aspect to them. But I think that they were, uh, they're, they're big, it, it's much more consumer friendly. The production of it's better. They like watching it better. They like the people on it better. And so they were like, oh no, I'm much more into that show than I ever was into Ghost Hunters. So I would love to see um, what people's opinion on is which more influential ghost hunters and ghost adventures. So when in doubt, I always fall back on what Jason Moore set, said to me, which is the one that did it first is more influential. Yeah. So we used to argue about who's the better drummer, Neil Peart or Ringo Starr. And even though he was a huge Neil Peart fan, I'm not sure if he did it just to annoy me. Hashtag Jason Moore said on this, right? Um, I'm just kidding. Don't actually. Um, but he would say like, no, because he wouldn't be doing what he was doing if Ringo Starr didn't do it first. And so I was like, all right, whatever. So I'm going to default to Ghost Hunters. Okay. Okay? So that was number four. Number four, the premiere of Ghost Hunters and uh, its influence over the world. Number three. Now, number number three. Yo, dog. It's a number three is a little bit hard for me to talk about, um, but I think that not that Amityville was easy, but um, I, I skipped over Amityville. Think you skipped over Amityville completely. You kind of skipped over Amityville. I think I went over it well. Yeah, sure. If other people have stuff that they want to say about Amityville, feel free or questions to ask. If people haven't heard the story about me at Amityville and they want to hear it, I'll share it later, blah, 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 if you want. But you have to post that you want to hear it for me to do it. I have mixed feelings about number three. But I'm going to give it its just due. I was having a conversation with Craig Paste. Yes. Craig Paste. I always get his name wrong. Craig Paste. P P A Y S T. I always want to say Paint. And uh, Craig Paste is a man who has the um, the Ghosts of um, North Carolina, and you know, I believe he's now doing Ghosts of Kentucky. Kentucky. Um, really great writer. Really great organizer. Like one of the cleanest ghost websites I've ever seen. Um, that doesn't feel like you're watching clickbait. So definitely go to those sites. We'll actually maybe put those sites in the in the foot in the, the notes. So I was talking to him uh, a few weeks ago because I wanted before a few weeks before we were going to do the show. So I wanted to have him on uh, on tripping on legends because he had a lot of interesting things to say and found some stuff out. And in, during our discussion of puckwudgies and our discussion of other creatures like puckwudgies, we were kind of talking about things. And then um, he threw out Lauren Coleman's name. Um, and so for me, number three um, is the publication, 1983, the publication of Mysterious America. I'm waiting dramatically. That was a dramatic pause. That was a dramatic pause. 1983, the publication of, excuse me, need to shift. No, it's okay. You're good. Okay. <clears throat> um, the publication of Mysterious America. Um if this was New England, I would say 1994 in the publication of um, the New England Ghost Files, but there's no uh, honorable mention here. So um, 1983, Lauren Coleman publishes Mysterious America, 
And I think that a lot of the ideas that are in Mysterious America um, were already floating around. He had already written about them. He had already written about um, the Bridgewater Triangle before the publication of that. But I think that this is, even if it's not acknowledged, this is the Bible of the paranormal and the supernatural um, for the last 35 years. And I think that if you are if you are into ghosts, if you are into conspiracy theories, and he might have an argument with that, but I'll explain why. If you are into cryptids, or if you're into UFOs, if you're into the weird and unusual, I think this book is the root of that. I think that if you are into someone like Nick Redfern or um, or, or, or Lyle, uh, uh, but to them, well, it's not Blackburn, but if you're into these people who are exploring cryptids and all the Boggy Creek stuff, all of the, all of the, the Mothman stuff that's come out since, since the 80s, if you're into any of that cryptid stuff, it's origins uh, of how things should be looked at, but then just the mere fact that you can like talk about these things. Yes, there were books before Mysterious America. Yes, there might be books that were published after Mysterious America that are important, but this is like the Bible. The people who you know, who you are influenced by, it's kind of just like that Ringo Starr thing. The things that the people who are influencing you now were influenced by that. So you've been influenced by it indirectly. There are very few people I know in the paranormal world who not, have not read that book or who are not influenced by that book in some way, shape, or form. You mentioned the Dover Demon. Yes. That's the full examination of the Dover Demon case, right? That's a huge paranormal... Let, when I back ten years ago, when I was teaching high, when I was teaching sophomores in high school, the book we had had a whole chapter on the Dover Demon. It was a book of cryptids, and it dedicated a whole section just to the Dover Demon. By the way, it got a lot of the facts wrong, but we're not going to call. We're not going to talk about that because they never returned return my emails about that. So <laughs> I'm pretty pissed. Um, it talked about some classic Bigfoot cases, right? But it is the birth of the Bridgewater Triangle. Um, and I know that I might be tainted somewhat to think that the Bridgewater Triangle um, is, is important, but I think that the Bridgewater Triangle and the ideas about it sparked a lot of investigators, um, and it sparked a lot of people who are into the paranormal. Um, it's the first real true examination, in-depth examination of Twilight language, of the name game, of this idea what is that... Twilight language? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> Um, Twilight language in the name game is just this mere fact that like are things that are named the same way uh, haunted? Is there a connection between them? Um, is there some force in the universe that causes these places to be named after the devil, for example, okay. and variations of the devil like How Faye and Faye and Bill? Places in Florida that are named the same. Remember we found that. Yeah, 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 there? yeah. Well, what was, what was that? that? You do that research. I don't remember. But the idea that there was a connection between seemingly unconnected paranormal events uh, or unconnected weird events. It kind of took uh, the idea of Fortean investigation and, and mixed it with this, this, this crossing of things uh, and conspiracy theories, which are really tough to, but I'm, I'm saying conspiracy theories because people start to find those connections in those moments as well. It laid out the groundwork for that, right? I mean, and we think now, and I, and I, and I, I know Cryptomundo is still there, but the Twilight language I think is hit even more. Um, whenever something happens, I go to the Twilight language to see um, why, what the connection is to other things. I remember very specifically when there was the shooting um, uh, in Aurora. And my immediate thought was uh, to be Coleman-esque and to look at, uh, I was trying to make connections between these events that were happening in Colorado and the Denver International Airport because, you know, we heard all these crazy things about the airport. Um, and, I, and, I, and I found myself, refer, what does Lord Coleman think about this? Um, what, what connections does Lord Coleman make? Um, and so I think that this book, this is the first book that talked about in depth about the um, the clown crazes or the, these clown um, um, happenings, these crazy clown, these killer clown incidents and, and talked about the origins of it and kind of taught us how to look at those kinds of cases. Um, the table of contents is literally just like a, a best of, a greatest hits of paranormal things that have been influential over like the last 35 years because of it. And it, it, it just had such an impact on people, mainly because of the writer. Um, and I think that Lauren Coleman's 
unemotional approach to these things helped with that. Uh, because whereas you can tell he was invested in the research, he took a step back. Um, even in even in even in the um, the um, what's the book that I'm thinking of? The Gabor and Coleman books, The Copycat Effect. Thank you, it, which is one of my probably the most influential book in my paranormal world is The Copycat Effect. Um, he didn't try to force his opinion of what it meant. He just showed you his approach, um, and I think that investigators and uh, of ufos of cryptids of ghosts of unusual occurrences of odd history i think have been following that template for the last 35 years um, and so my number three publication of uh of mysterious america 1983 what do you think of that sounds good yeah, I've never read it, so. you've never read it. No, no, and I'm, and 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 one of the things I, I I was gonna say that I forgot is that I also think it was a book that. Do you think uh, that really transcended the that line between consumer and investigator? Well, what I'm saying, what I was gonna say is that I think that it's really hard for some people to pick up a book about Bigfoot, right, or a book about um, ghosts, unless or, they've had an experience. Unless they've yes. had an experience, right? And there's something in the language of Lauren Coleman that connects with people so it becomes one of those things where it's not easy like read. it's a, i don't want to say easy reading that he's using simple language or anything like that but the way that he connects things makes it easy for a person who's on the outside of these things to understand i've got a quick question for you yes so we talked about like the dover demon and the killer clowns things like that mm -hmm. and they seem to recur uh every couple of years they they become re relevant again besides slenderman which i know is recent it's an internet yeah. made Entity or person, rather, mm -hmm. has there any been? Has there been anything else new that's been made up or or has been become relevant within the paranormal field, like Slenderman? Well, yeah, uh, I think um, blue the blue whale, um, and the blue whale has been this kind of suicide cult. Oh yeah, um, mm -hmm. that they've touched on, and you should if you should. Sorry, she, she then asked me a question and tells me to face the camera. I right. talk to you guys. Um, I think the blue whale, and then with that, it, what is it, Momo, right? Is it Momo or, or Mojo? I've never heard um, of Momo. Which is... Oh, yeah, like the devil thing, right? What? Isn't Momo supposed to be like the YouTube devil thing? It's kind of like, it, it's this, once again, like kind of like a cult. It kind of takes the blue whale suicide cult and switches it up. Um, and it has got a lot more mainstream um, appeal to it, which is, and you should follow, you should definitely follow us uh, on Twitter and on Facebook because I've been posting stuff about this. But the idea of it is it's kind of like a, um, an escalating um, stunt group, right? And so you're supposed to, at the beginning, it's like, okay, go outside at, at midnight and knock on a neighbor's door, right? And then it escalates until eventually when you get to the last level of it, it's supposed to be now kill yourself. And so these suicides have been connected to this whole uh, – and, and it's all – it's all directed. It's all run by this weird, distorted person whose name is I want to say it's Mojo or Momo. I think it's Momo because it's. I think we're getting the two things confused. It was like a Criminal Minds episode about this kind of stuff. Yes, there was. There was. There was. And it was the kid. It was the father who was right. doing it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, That's pretty insane. Yeah. Yeah. And it's and it's not necessarily new, but what's new, like it's not a new idea that they have these like suicide cults or the choking clubs, right. stuff like that. What's new with this is that. They're connecting all of these random suicides, uh, and they're checking the kids' social media, and they're finding that the kids at least try to connect with this group, um, or they have some influence, or they have some posts, or they posted some videos that are connected to it, and because of that, they're associating this urban legend with, uh, or or the urban legend that people are doing it, they're creating it themselves, mm -hmm. um, when really it's just a whole bunch of troubled kids who are drawn to this macabre stuff who are then also killing themselves but because they've have it on their social media or they have it left in their phones or they visited the site um it becomes linked to it. right it becomes yeah. linked to it we can do a whole like show just on that if you want like in yeah, a couple of weeks or whatever yeah, so um just so i can have that stuff in <laughs> i think jeff the killer um, is probably something, and if I you're talking, Jeff the, Killer Jeff the Killer is a very similar like the Ring kind of thing. He's he's a Slenderman type figure, 
Um, internet born. Internet born. Internet born. You can track it down just the same way you could uh, with Sunderman. Number two. And Jen kind of took some of my thunder on this, um, and I've written on this before. It's Poltergeist, mm -hmm. the movie Poltergeist. Um, if there is a movie, and it's not The Exorcist, if there is a movie that has moved the needle of the way people think about the paranormal, it has got to be Poltergeist. Um, real, fake, uh, uh, um, the future, the, the two and three, and all of these, all these weird things that have to do with that. Oh no, it's okay, Jen. It's okay. You were, we were in sync, you and I. And wait, by the way, Jen, here, here's a clue on what I want to talk to you about because it fits with what we're saying. Everything meshes in Hudson Town. See if you remember that. <laughs> um, Poltergeist is first of all, it's PG. Right? I was just telling someone about this, uh, one of the teachers, that I was actually able to show that with all the drug references and the swearing and the flipping off and the scariness and people ripping their faces off. It's a PG movie. You can go show it to your 10-year-old. It's okay. Right? Um, it, in addition to just being like one of the scariest movies of all time uh, and a movie that holds up, right? And oddly enough, the thing, um, the thing that doesn't hold up with it is the thing that's the like – my hat's on weird. Okay, and I can't figure out how to make it good. Um, the thing that's weird about the thing that the only thing that didn't hold up was the scene that they try to make scary, which the guy's ripping his face off, and maybe that special effect is bad. The rest of it, the idea of once again, just like Amityville, that you move into a house and your youngest child goes missing, um, that there are paranormal forces knocking at your door trying to get into your house, that you don't know what happened to where you live before, that there could be some kind of tragedy that is going to, that is causing disruption in your house, that your kids can be affected, that they're, and, and all of these elements scare homeowners, right? There are very few people I know who have not seen the movie Poltergeist. Have you seen the movie Poltergeist? Yep. Natalie has seen it. Okay. Natalie hasn't seen anything and she's seen Poltergeist. Um, you know, I'm kidding, right? Yes. I haven't seen the Sandlot. Um, <laughs> So, but then if you take a step back, uh, and I wrote the article, um, you know, uh, lies that, that Poltergeist told me, it created the reason for a ghost for the next, once again, 35 years, right? Your ghost is haunted because there are, there are people buried underneath it. Yeah. It's built on a Native American burial ground. Um, really you can, guilt. would say, yeah, yeah, really, really push white man's guilt on it. Um, you can get rid of ghosts by doing this. Ghosts communicate to us this way. Um, ghosts are energy. Um, uh, the whole metaphor of, of burnt toast uh, and, the, and, that, and, and that scent still being in the air was what a ghost is. The idea that you can communicate, right? Um, the idea that there were people out there who were looking into this stuff, right? Those were all really, and they weren't, they're not necessarily new ideas, but I think it was a perfect storm of a perfect movie with an amazing script that so many people saw and had the catch line, you know, they're here and a creepy girl and all those things kind of combined to make us scared of that clown in the corner of our room. Right. Um, to give us so much of an explanation of why um, things are haunted and how ghosts act that we are still kind of suffering the waves of that. We still think ghosts are what, poltergeist told us that they were ghostbusters right i don't know anyone who hasn't seen ghostbusters the original ghostbusters have you seen the original ghostbusters i commented about it earlier yes. oh did you i, I wasn't I did. Yes. you know i'm trying to talk here i'm not always able oh, yeah. to look at the car oh, yeah. anyway right i said that was probably one of the most influential things too right ghostbusters. Ghost, ghostbusters and yet right like the realism of ghostbusters is not as it's obviously not as real as, as Poltergeist, and so I don't feel it resonates as deeply as, as Poltergeist because Poltergeist could happen, right? People aren't Which necessarily one came out first. Poltergeist or Ghostbusters? I want to say Poltergeist first is 1982, and Ghostbusters is 1984, but I could be wrong about that. She's going to check. My fact checker is going to check that. Um, but Ghost Hunters, could, I mean Ghostbusters couldn't happen. Right, the whole idea of capturing a ghost and trapping a ghost, and then all the ghosts escape, and you know there is no Dana only Zool, um, and the humor of it didn't take the the subject matter seriously. Um, I don't think it was as influential. Yeah. I think Both probably. Ghostbusters was 1982. Ghostbusters was 84. 
I got it exactly right. You got it exactly right. I am IMDb. <laughs> um, and so I think people watched that movie and felt that they understood ghosts. They knew what ghosts were. They knew what ghosts acted like. So my number two, and I'm only cutting off ghost uh, poltergeist a little bit because we're running out of time a little bit. Um, my number two is the release of Poltergeist. Number one. And I know I'm going to catch some shit for this. I said shit. Whatever. Drum roll. That was the worst drum roll ever. Come on, get it. I'm sick. Come on. All right. Number one, and some people might feel this is self-serving, it is the release of Haunted Objects by Christopher... No, it's not. Oh. Just kidding. It's not. It's not. It's um, going to give me so much shit. For that. You were going to give me so much shit. Whatever. My number one most influential moment in the history uh, of the paranormal for the last 50 years is... I, I know I'm not going to get this date wrong. 1999, October 1999. The publication, the pre, the release, the... I don't even know how you would say it. I guess publishing. We used to call it back in the day. The publishing of Ghost Village um, by Jeff Belanger. Um, Ghost Village has changed the way that we consume, the way we view, the way we um, have in our lives to paranormal um, for the last 19 years. I think consume is the best one, best word that you can use there, as adjective that you can use there. Absorb. <laughs> um, there were ghost sites before Ghost Village, um, but they weren't as good. Uh, through Jeff's anal, meticulous, like play the ball where it's going to be, not where it is, It was this website was designed in such a way that stories were held up against uh, uh, discussion boards. And these discussion boards were like the cleanest discussion boards. For those of us who are old enough to know when the internet was discussion boards, right? And that was like the primary thing. You went on and you discussed shit and you went, but then people commented and they posted and they put, this was the first time that people, the average person who had experienced something in the paranormal could go and talk about what they had experienced. This was the first place where groups, paranormal groups from uh, um, from California could talk to one from New York and they could exchange ideas. This was the website that held up the paranormal as something serious, something to be, to be understood. Um, and so you had this mix of personal stories that were, they'd be posts, right? You could go in and you could search your area and you could find things that had happened in your area. Um, these were uh, people who were intelligent, who were articulate, who were good writers, who were also exploring the ideas of the paranormal. Why did the paranormal exist? Um, how did the Mercy Brown case connect to uh, something that happened in the Midwest in the 1950s? I mean, this was the first place where the unexplained was starting to be explained. And the average person was connecting to it, right? It was one of those things where you didn't need to know, you didn't need to have any knowledge going into it. You just had to be like, I wonder what this, I wonder, you know, I had this ghost that used to appear um, in, in in the down the street, like we had, there's a story about it. I wonder if it's anyone else has experienced it. And you couldn't go, and you couldn't just type in, you know, uh, Worcester, Massachusetts, uh, ghost, uh, Longwood Cemetery, and things would come up. Instead, you'd go to Ghost Village, um, and Ghost Village, you could either do it as a discussion, or someone might have posted about it. Someone might have written a personal story, and it was at that time the cleanest website you could possibly go to about this thing as well, right? It wasn't uh, one of those Angel Fire or GeoCity ones. This was like a professional looking website that took the subject matter that no one else was taking seriously and presented it to you as if it was something that you should be paying attention to. So I've got a quick question because um, yes. I'm a youngin. How, She's a youngin. How did people find websites like Ghost Village if there weren't really any search engines? I mean, there was like MSN, right? Like, what? No, I mean, there were search engines. They were called web crawlers, web crawlers. <laughs> right? Okay. And they did it almost strictly on keywords within it. So even before there was like meta tagging, right? Like people would literally like put in keywords and they would find things, right? And mm. Ghost Village was the first place that I remember uh, that had a page of links to your area. 
Now, the the precursor, I think, in some ways, to Ghost Village um, was uh, Obi Wan. So, if anyone out there who's listening. Do you, who remembers Obi-Wan? I don't even know if the site is still up. I should go check that. Obi-Wan's UFO-free paranormal page. Um, and that was the place where people would go for true ghost stories, places in their area, stuff like that. But here was the difference. Obi-Wan never responded to you. Jeff would respond to you, right? Or or Louis Arbach would respond to you. Or, 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 or uh, Deanna Ke- uh, Kelly would respond to you. Like, these people would actually... Um, when you ask them a question about their article, would get back to you. They would talk to you, right? right? First time I ever talked to Jeff. Hey, what's going on, Rob? I hope you're feeling better. Um, um, first time I ever talked to Jeff was not as like, hey, I'm a ghost. I'm, I'm an investigator. You're an investigator. Let's be friends. It was I asked him for advice on something, right? And, you know, like 15 years later, look where we are. Um, and it was Jeff's personality that drove it. It was Jeff's idea of like this is going to be clean and this is going to be um, um, and then I'm going to let people do what they do, right? I'm going to let people who know what they're doing run this section and run that section and give up power and let them do that. I, for those of you guys who don't know, for about eight years I ran the news. I was the news director of Ghost Village. Did you know that? Yeah. No, she didn't even know that. And so I would actually put out the news just like I did for Spooky South Coast after that and just like I kind of do informally with what we're doing now. And it was always be right, uh, do it with integrity, and put it out there and make it fun, right? And so anyone who's ever heard Jeff speak, um, and, and he has a great way of, of talking about these these paranormal things and, and getting people to laugh about them, but then also cry about them and be sad about them and be scared about them and all those things. And Ghost Village reflected that. And so you could go there and you could spend hours. It was like the first really, truly uh, deep rabbit hole that I got into, right? <laughs> and here was the other thing about it. Unlike other, thank you very much, Rob. I'm good, I'm, it's good to hear that you're doing well. I'm, I'm, I was worrying about you there for a while. Um, Ghost Village didn't have, and I don't wanna, I don't wanna, I don't wanna lift him up by putting other people down, but I wanna, like pe- places like the Shadowland or even like uh, True Ghosts, uh, um, their, their primary work was a list that could be edited of haunted places, uh, and so it, it it lost. It didn't have the personality. It didn't have the integrity, and it didn't have the um, research into it that Ghost Village did. Right? Then those sites became very popular, and those sites are, um, um, you know, they're still going now, and, and they've changed the way they look. and And those people who run those, I, I've, I've talked to most of them, and they're and they're great people, but it didn't have the class of Ghost Village. Right? It didn't have um, that. Uh, that this is the go-to place for these kinds of things. You found, um, you found uh, only in your state things like only in your state, or you found uh, um, uh, Shadowlands because you were searching for something and it brought you there. Ghost Village, you went to it to find out more information. I want to know about this vampire. I want to know about Dudley Town. I'm going to Ghost Village to do the research. Once the first after the first time that you explored it, um, you kept going back to it. And I think that that organization and that connecting and that um, creating a database, creating an archive of information about the paranormal, um, I think that that grew the field. And and so someone like Natalie, who had a passing interest, could go there and do the research. Someone who was doing like investigative research and wanted to find out about the best techniques or find out about like what other things were like this went to Ghost Village. But then I also think the 10-year-old doing a report – um, on um, on a local haunting that they had heard of or an urban legend, went found Ghost Village and was able to pull out research for it and use it. I remember actually going, I was tutoring this kid and I was like, okay, we're going to do a report on something spooky. And he literally pulled out pages and pages he had printed off of Ghost Village. Wow. Um, and it was like, I know that guy. Mm-hmm. Um, so a little bit self-serving uh, because Jeff is a friend and I used to work for it. And I'm still kind of, you know, in some ways connected to it. I did Ghost Village for Kids. We tried to, to launch that and stuff like that. But ultimately, I think um, the publishing of, of Ghost Village is the most important paranormal and supernatural event in the last 50 years. So that is my list. First place, I, first, I probably, uh, if I'm not mistaken, I handled that deal to get your book advertised on Ghost Village, if I'm not mistaken, Rob. Um, back in the para... What was my old PR firm called? 
Pararelations, pararelations days. Um, that's my list. I would love to hear you guys' feedback on it. I would love to hear what you think about what I said and then, like, why I'm wrong. I I'm a teacher. I love to hear why I'm wrong all day long. So I might as well hear it here as well. Um, we're going to be coming back uh, hopefully next week with a new episode of Tripping on Legends. Until then, um, you can follow us at Facebook backslash Tripping on Legends. Um, on Twitter, I am Spooky Balzano. I am Natalie Christ. And on uh, Instagram, and we're putting a lot more stuff on Instagram these days because, like, we're trying to get that young crowd because they're more like. <laughs> um, I am at Spooky Tripping. You can also contact me at SpookyTripping at gmail.com. Tripping on Legends. TrippingOnLegends.wordpress.com is the website. But honestly, follow us on Facebook, and that way you can get to all that other stuff because we post it on Facebook first. So for Christopher Balzano, yeah, Chris. for um, for the 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 Lutzes, for um, Lauren Coleman, for Jeff Belanger, for Steven Spielberg and Toby Hooper, and for what else did I say? What was my other one? Uh, no. dun, 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 dun. Yeah. Anyway, here's hoping all of your influences are legendary. Have a wonderful evening. Thanks for stopping by. Yeah.